This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. In a city overrun with violence, one gang dominates. The Avengers is a big gang. We're a thousand strong. They don't bother to beat you up. They just kill you. None is more violent or vicious. All I wanted to do was hurt people. I didn't care if I got killed. It was war. You had to go out there and shoot people whenever you were called upon. In this barrio, warriors are made, not born. These kids in these neighborhoods don't grow up worshiping football stars. They grow up wanting to be gangsters. Gangbanging was my sex. It was better than drugs. The Avenues. In L.A., they are the highway to hell. That's one avenue sign that's this one right here. Los Angeles, the city of angels. From its white sand beaches to its majestic vistas and Hollywood, it embodies the California dream. But it's also the gang capital of the world, a refuge for more than 150,000 gangbangers. Three miles northeast of downtown lies Highland Park one of the oldest areas in the city. This predominantly Hispanic hood is bordered by Eagle Rock, Cypress Park, the 110 Freeway, and Glacelle Park. Its rolling hills and tranquil family-style homes hide the area's violence. It looks nice, you know, the tree-lined uh, little narrow streets look beautiful. But you also have one of the most dangerous gangs in all Los Angeles in those same tree-lined streets. Los Avenidas, the avenues. 800 strong, they are the barrio's largest gang. They take their name from the numbered avenues that intersect Highland Park's main thoroughfare, Figueroa Street. Their turf stretches nearly six square miles. The avenue's secretive ways and violent nature have wreaked havoc on their enemies, innocent citizens, even their own members. The gang is responsible for more than 100 murders in the last two decades alone. The LAPD's Northeast Division have one of the highest crime rates in the city. JR asked to have his identity altered. In 1988, after being jumped into the avenues, he rose quickly through the ranks. We had guys who would knock you out in a heartbeat. We guys who would shoot you in a heartbeat. We guys who would stab you in a heartbeat. We guys who took care of business. JR was 15 years old when he and his group of friends killed for the first time. A few of us went for a walk to the store, and on the way back, we ran into this guy that was preaching to us. He was all drunk and saying stuff, and we told him to get lost, and he threw a sign at us. We went back and we beat him, stabbed him to death. He and his friends were never arrested for the murder. JR began running his neighborhood crew. They would challenge anyone. In 1998, another gang, the Border Brothers, started harassing some girls from their hood. The Border Brothers didn't know who they were dealing with, and a fight turned into a couple guys getting shot, and I happened to have a weapon that day, and I had to do what I had to do. JR pulled out his 9mm and shot one of the rival gang members in the leg. He and his crew fled, escaping arrest again. Could have been worse. Could have been, you know, dead bodies everywhere. 
the avenues noticed and asked JR to join. The avenues make their money in LA's fiercely competitive but lucrative drug trade. The gang has an advantage in building its empire. Their maze-like territory is the key to their success. A lot of the streets there in that area and avenues uh, uh, lend themselves to narcotics dealing because they're dead-end streets. The avenues protect their business from rival gangs like Cypress Park and the Border Brothers by any means necessary. You know, someone comes in, you gotta do what you gotta do, whether it's gang members, whether it's somebody making a wrong turn, you gotta take care of business. While their drug business provides funding, the gang is more known for its secretive and violent nature. Their specialties include brutal home invasions, robberies, and carjackings. There's a lot of activity going on all 24 hours. Anything illegal, we had our hands in it. Whether it was somebody doing fake credit cards, shipping phones, anything illegal. The Avenue's hardcore gangsters are idols for many kids. Those were our role models. Those were the ones that used to run the neighborhood back in those days. Those were the ones that used to do all the shootings. Those were the ones that did all the crazy stuff. You know? And everybody respected them. And I said, why can't I do that? Sleepy asked to have his identity concealed. He joined the Avenues when he was 10 years old, fulfilling his dream of becoming a gangster. By 12, he began carrying out hits with the gang. We were going through alleys and shooting dudes from Highland Park, shooting dudes from Cypress Park, you know, throwing cocktails through people's houses. It was just like a thing to do. The lifestyle gave Sleepy purpose. He became a loyal soldier, embracing the gang's violent and secretive culture. Gang banging was better than drugs. There was no better rush than that. The avenues were the love of my life. It didn't matter what time they called me. I'd be there. Having news comes first. And that's who we were. The world JR and Sleepy joined was a bloody brotherhood with only two ways to the top. If you can make them some money, you're going to move up quick. If you're a good murderer, if you kill people for them, you're going to move up quick. Basically, make money or kill people. That's how they move up fast. Even innocent bystanders can fall prey to Los Avenidas. In 1998, the Avenues joined the Hispanic gangs in LA in declaring a race war on African Americans. Their goal was to reduce Highland Park's black population. There's 500 Hispanic gang uh, operating in Los Angeles, but the avenues were one of the ones in particular that took this hate message to heart and then began attacking uh, uh, African Americans on the street. The avenues went on a killing spree, callously murdering three black men who were in their neighborhood. The avenues felt so comfortable in their own community, they didn't wait for the cover of darkness to commit some of their crimes. They did it in broad daylight. Come into uh, Avenue's territory, which has always been our stronghold. When it sues, it's violence. You know, people are gonna get murdered. A white sugar coat, you know. There's one whether he's selling drugs or not, just he's black. The bloodshed was fueled not only by racial hatred, but by the battle for lucrative drug turf. This former LAPD detective asked to have his identity altered. If something happens and you're stranded there, you may have a problem. They're gonna walk up to you, they're gonna ask you who you are, where you're from, what are you doing? As far as they're concerned, you're a threat. September 17th, 
1995, 2 a.m. 25-year-old Timothy Stone left a barbecue in Glacelle Park with his girlfriend, her brother, and two children. They started towards their Cypress Park home. While driving, Stone tried to take a shortcut and turned onto a narrow winding road that came to a dead end. Locals knew the street as the Avenue of the Assassins. As Stone neared the dead end, he found 20 avenues who just happened to be waiting to ambush a rival. There was a Cypress Park gang. Previous that day had been driving through there shooting at the guys. And so they were uh, out there with their guns waiting just in case they came back. Stone tried to turn around only to find himself trapped. Gang members blocked his exit with garbage cans and other debris. In a panic, Stone accelerated through the barricade as the avenues opened fire. No matter what time of day it is, somebody's on a mission out there driving around to find somebody to kill. That's just business. Los Angeles. A sprawling city of nearly four million, filled with expressways, palm trees, and strip malls. It's also home to one of the city's most violent street gangs, the Avenues. They put fear into the neighborhood, fear into the youngsters. They demand respect, so they get it. That respect is well earned. The Avenues have been representing in LA for more than half a century. Their origins trace to the 1940s Zoot Suit era. The gang started when local Hispanic youth formed a club to protect themselves. They were mostly peaceful until the 1960s when heroin flooded the streets. The avenues became part of the lucrative drug trade and grew increasingly violent. As they grew up, and they started going to juvenile hall, going to county jail, going to prison. They graduated to a higher level of criminal activity. They started to develop that commitment to the gang and the business of the gang. The gang's older members began returning from the Vietnam War. They came back with deadly skills and unique insight into America's booming illegal drug trade. The Avenues began putting that knowledge to use when a rival gang, Cypress Park, formed nearby in 1969. The two gangs went to war over lucrative drug turf as narcotic sales exploded. They turned even more deadly in the 1980s when crack hit the streets. The AKs came in, the AR-15s, as the 80s progressed, it was gangbanging. Shootings were everyday occurrence. JR was raised by a single mom on Division Street, the heart of the Avenue's territory. They were known as tough guys, you know, nobody messed with them. That was the intriguing part of it. He was exposed to the reality of gang life on the playground. A neighbor's father, who was a gang member, took us to a park, and they were playing football. And a rival gang, Cypress Park, came by and shot off the freeway and shot in into the football game. And two guys ended up getting killed. To protect themselves, JR and his boys decided to form their own gang. They developed ruthless reputations. We were called the insane ones. We were known for fighting. It wasn't long before the Avenues noticed. They approached us and said, hey, the Avenues either join us or break up. We did the smart thing and joined. The Avenues were at war with rival gangs Highland Park and Cypress Park. 
the gang was known to cross into enemy turf to provoke a fight. And JR was eager to be a part of it. We walk or we drive through here looking for guys, rival gang members. On any given day, you could find them hanging out in these alleys, and that's how you got one. If you really wanted to find them, you'd just come walk down this alley, and they'd come out and be a shootout. You needed to have a gun. If you were in the neighborhood, you needed to pack a gun. That was known to rival gangs, shoot at them. I knew if it had, how to turn it up a notch when it came time to. The Avenue's membership was growing and numbered 500 by the mid-80s. The gang had become a legacy for some families. Sleepy, one of seven brothers and sisters, grew up in Glacelle Park, a gang stronghold in Northeast LA. He was nine years old when his older brother, an Avenue, was shot by a rival gang member. I seen an ambulance parked down the street. And I was like, the hell? I knew whose house it was at, because that was my, my brother's girlfriend's house. I said, what happened? What's going on? Your brother just got shot. Sleepy's immediate thought was for revenge. I, I lost it. I just lost it. I just ran, yelling out, you know, avenues, avenues. Sleepy's brother survived, but a year later was shot and wounded a second time. He cheated death again, but Sleepy couldn't let it go. He committed to the avenues for life. Yeah, if it's worth him dying to the, for this neighborhood, then it, it's worth it to me. You know, that's my brother, and I can't let him go out like that by himself. His brother made sure it wasn't a traditional jump in. Well, he beat us up for, I'd say, about a good minute. I mean, just beat us up. Like, we were getting beat up by somebody, you know, that we didn't even know. And then he got a BB gun, and I'll never forget this. He goes, this is what it's going to feel like almost when you guys get shot. So right there, he just he shot us. And I was like, well, man, it hurt me. You know, it really did. It didn't take long for the reality of gang life to take hold. In 1984, while driving his car through the neighborhood, Sleepy threw out the avenue sign to a group of rivals standing on a street corner. I seen those guys and I started throwing the A at them, you know. I didn't think they were gonna get in their car and chase me. Moments later, he stopped at a red light, only to find he was blocked in by three other cars. So all I remember is this guy coming out, you know, from the window, from the passenger. And he goes, Cypress Park. You know, and I go, oh, f Cypress Park. This is the avenues, man. And he starts shooting at me. So I just put my hand over my head. I went like this, and I went down. I hit, felt the bullet hit my hand. But that hit me in the head. Sleepy walked away with a scar and a new thirst for blood. There was no stopping me. I wanted to die. I didn't care. By the late 1980s, gang-related murders in the Highland Park area were skyrocketing. The LAPD began to take notice. As the avenues gained strength on the streets, they also made inroads in California's prisons, which were controlled by the infamous prison gang, the Mexican Mafia, or La M A. La M A is an elite alliance of 50,000 Hispanic members. The coalition is controlled by a board of the highest ranking leaders known as Carnals. In 1988, 24-year-old Avenue member Alex Aguirre, street named Pee Wee, was doing time in state prison. Alex comes from a family of Mexican Mafia members, associates, and drug dealers. He was schooled at a very early age on how to be a drug dealer. It paid off. 
On the inside, Pee-wee fought his way to the top of Laame. Of the nearly 50,000 soldiers working for the Mafia, Agiri was one of only 300 made men, or Karnals. For these exclusive members, power is nearly limitless. Their word can mean the difference between life and death. Agiri's promotion meant the Avenues had four board members, giving them unique influence within La M.A. The Avenues were at the top of the food chain. They have much closer ties than the average Hispanic street gang to the Mexican Mafia. They, they sort of see themselves as a cut above the average sort of gangbanger street gang. At the upper echelons of the Avenues street gang, you can't tell where the Avenues leaves off and the Mafia begins. It's so integrated. It's one continuous line from the lowliest street soldier all the way up to the uh, made members of the Mafia. In 1989, Aguirre was paroled. With his La M.A. connections, he assumed leadership of the Avenues. Pee Wee's word became law and the Avenues took on a new agenda. Alex Aguirre comes out of prison, starts establishing that this is his territory. He's part of the Mexican Mafia now. It became uh, more about the money than gangbanging. The Avenues aligned themselves even more closely with the Mexican Mafia and began to cut them in on their drug trade. In 1992, a message went out to all the other Hispanic street gangs operating in Southern California. They needed to pay the Mexican Mafia, or it was war. With the avenues leading the way, most of the gangs complied, agreeing to kick drug money to La M.A. It really wasn't until that major policy initiative in the early 90s where you actually saw a two-way connection where the street gangs identified heavily with the Mexican Mafia, and the Mexican Mafia, in turn, had tr control on these street gangs. The avenues began to turn L.A. into the crack capital of America. This is one of the spots I used to come pick up money for Alex and for our crew. Aguirre appointed crew leaders to collect from dealers. JR became one of the chosen. When me, about three, four guys, drive up, go to the back, there'd be guys right here, his, his little gang members hanging out right here, keeping point. I go back to get the money and get on. If they didn't pay, we'd shut them down. We'd take their drugs, their money, assault them. There's plenty of times I pulled out my gun just to show, show that I was packing a gun, show them I had something with me. There's time to have the pistol whip them, there's time to have to fire it off, give them that warning. The avenues seemed invincible, but their reign of terror was not going unnoticed. If you establish yourself as a truly badass, as they did, well, it brings down a lot of law enforcement attention, which they didn't want. Los Avenidas. In LA, they control Highland Park with an iron fist. Here, on the winding dead-end streets, this narrow three-block strip stands out as the most violent. Drew Street. This is Drew Street, one of the most notorious parts of Los Angeles. This place was a 24-hour drug mart. Gas meter readers wouldn't come here. The only reason we're able to be here at all is because about four months ago, the police and the federal law enforcement officers did this massive raid on the street. We can never film uh, an interview right here on this street where I'm standing right now. Prior to the bust, a lucrative drug trade thrived in the crowded apartment complexes. This is where all the money was made. This is where in a given day, especially on the weekend, you'd find 50 to 60 drug dealers hanging on the street. It'd be like a drive through at a McDonald's or something on a busy day. Homeboys keeping watch with their guns, 
of the apartment buildings. You have limos coming through, you have Mercedes coming through, you have all kinds of different kind of people from different, you know, sides of the, of the city. This tree-lined street is a perfect hideout for gangsters. If you look up to the north here, you can see how the, the apartments form almost a fortress. And you can kind of observe who's coming from a variety of important points around the area. What happens is once the cops are coming through, everyone starts yelling and everyone runs like cockroaches. They run back to the apartments and hide, stash their dope. One or two gates caught, they're gone. Three, four come out. That's how it works. It never stops. The avenues are divided into cliques. The Cypress Avenues are considered the originals, followed by the 43rd Avenues, Avenues 57, Division Street, Drew Street, and the Assassins. They all live by a unique code that starts with their ink. Most of the gang members have a skull with a fedora and a fur coat. That's Avenues uh, tattoo. The skull is also drawn with a bullet hole in the temple, or with the numbers one and three in the eyes. The number 13 represents the 13th letter of the alphabet, M. It's a nod to the Mexican Mafia, La M.A. The avenues fly the color blue, like most Hispanic gangs in L.A. And they represent by sporting Dodgers gear. They like to wear the L.A. Dodgers hat because the symbol is L.A. And L.A. can also stand for Los Avenidas. The code of conduct isn't just about the avenue's pride. The gang's members are expected to make money running drugs. Disobeying authority or skimming drugs is punishable by thrashings they call beatdowns. Senior gang members frequently dole them out at secret weekly meetings in 57th Park. When we usually had our Sunday meetings right here at the park. It would be about 100, 150 of us right here. Whoever needed to be regulated or checked, take them down here for a beat down. Sometimes it turned out worse. Sometimes it turned into a stabbing. Sometimes it would be a shooting. Major offenses, such as falsely claiming to be an avenue, can result in death. One day, this guy shows up here with the avenue skull tattooed on him, and he wasn't even jumped in. So the homie decided that he needed to be taught a lesson. So they grab a knife, walk up to him, and slice his uh, throat real quick. And but that's how we had to do it, you know. They came in, and they went from the neighborhood and came in representing when they weren't supposed to. They got taught a lesson. A gang member caught snitching might pay for it with his life. The gang calls dealing with this type of offense, cleaning up the books. Clean up the books, that means it's gotta get rid of the deadwood, it's gotta get rid of snitches, it's gotta get rid of people who aren't productive. When we cleaned our own books, it was usually, say a guy from the avenues was in prison and he messed up. He went protective custody for some reason. So when he came home, we'd clean him up. We'd have to take care of our own homeboy, or see as we met murder. We'd keep it clean. The gang considers snitching to be among the worst offenses a member can commit. But before punishment occurs, the avenues look for paperwork. Paperwork? is any proof by uh, either a court document or an interview or any, any kind of written proof. And vengeance can happen quickly when gang members least expect it. If you're a relatively unsophisticated gang member, you don't know about all these rules. You go to court, those transcripts work their way up the prison system to get to the shot callers, and the next time he comes into custody, he's a dead man.
the Avenues, one of the largest gangs in Los Angeles, have strict rules to keep their soldiers in line. Thanks to their ties to the Mexican Mafia prison gang, the Avenue's duties don't end on the streets. JR knew the deal when he landed in Corcoran State Prison after being arrested for a series of carjackings. When I got there, there were several homeboys there already. The Avenue's is a big gang. There was plenty of guys around. It's like coming home. On the inside, avenues are required to carry out hits for the Mexican Mafia. If they send down the word that you have to assault somebody, you got to do it. That's part of your duties. We were at war with the blacks. And what happened was any time they cracked those doors, it was on. So when they released us to yard, we had to assault the blacks. No questions asked. I assaulted 10 to 11 people while I was incarcerated for different reasons. You either had to assault them with your hands or with a razor or with, if you had a prison shank, whatever you could get your hands on, it was war. Sleepy also landed behind bars, serving a six-year sentence in state prison for the kidnapping of a rival gang member. He too was ordered to carry out assaults, developing a sadistic strategy to drown out the screams of his victims. We gotta sing a happy birthday to everybody in the, in the, in the whatever side you were on. Yeah, as soon as you heard happy birthday, it was because he was getting whacked. Sleepy describes how the avenues took out one rival. So everybody's singing, happy birthday to you, really loud. So everybody's singing, and this guy's getting stabbed. And he's on himself all over the place, you know. That's how bad the fear of God is put into you. Those who don't recognize the avenue's power always pay a high price. September 17th, 1995, 2 a.m. 25-year-old Timothy Stone, his girlfriend, her brother, and two children had made a wrong turn onto Isabel Street, which came to a dead end in Avenue's territory. They came down this alley. It was nighttime. So in this area here, they encountered a bunch of gang members. The Avenues, lying in wait for a rival gang, showed no mercy to Stone and his passengers. They start backing their vehicle up basically like I'm doing. The gang members get behind the car and try to block it with trash cans and other debris. Stone accelerated through the barricade as three Avenue members opened fire. He was immediately struck in the back. Two-year-old Joseph Kuhn was hit in the foot. His three-year-old sister, Stephanie, was struck by a bullet while sitting in her car seat. She was killed instantly. The others survived, but the three-year-old's killing gained national attention. This particular murder kind of galvanized the city and it caused a tremendous amount of public outcry. It is characterized as the wrong way murder. The murder prompted former President Bill Clinton to speak out against the avenues. A family took one wrong turn, and because they were in the wrong place, gang members felt they had the right to shoot at them and take their lives and kill an innocent child. Three members of the avenues were convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. The senseless killing made the gang among LA's most infamous. Prior to that, virtually nobody in Los Angeles had heard of the Avenue Street Gang. It, it brought the Avenues to nationwide attention, and they kind of got a charge out of it. By now, the Avenue's membership was more than 1,000. The LAPD began targeting the gang with a vengeance, and their leader, 31-year-old Alex Aguirre 
aka Pee-wee, was on top of their most wanted list. Aguirre, a made man, was arrested for parole violation. He was then indicted in a federal RICO case aimed at dismantling the Mexican Mafia. Aguirre was one of 22 high-ranking members brought to trial. The indictment charged Aguirre with involvement in seven murders and six other attempted murders. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. But before he left the streets, Aguirre named an unlikely successor. His 14-year-old brother, Richard Little Pee Wee Aguirre. Very young at the time, I think he was like 14 years old, running a major drug enterprise on behalf of the Mexican Mafia, which is unheard of. I don't think there's any there's any parallels to it in the business world. It's like some high school kid running IBM or something. In the mid-90s, a violent power struggle emerged within the avenues as a result of Aguirre's decision. Some of the older guys didn't really like Richie and his new group of guys he had, the younger guys kind of took charge. Alex wasn't there to monitor it firsthand. Many members resented taking orders from the teenaged Richie, who was half their age. So how am I going to listen to a little punk? How the hell am I going to listen to you? The only reason I, I, I didn't hurt him was because of his brother. Because either way, if you hurt him, it's his brother. Blood is blood. Little Pee Wee knew he had to gain the gang's respect. And there was only one way to do it. Little Richie took the initiative and stepped it up. He tried to prove himself right away. We would see little Richard Aguirre come out and, and ride his bicycle up and down the street like a normal kid his age. But in fact, we'd know that he would also be on the phone, cell phone ordering uh, murder, you know, uh, drug dealing, and all these other uh, functions that Mexican sh Mafia shot callers would order. In his first year in power, Richie orchestrated three brutal murders. First, a fellow Avenue member, Joseph Torres, was gunned down for collecting taxes in an area once run by the Aguirres. Next, a reputed drug dealer was killed for refusing to pay drug taxes. Then, rival gang member Raul Rodriguez was shot and killed for snitching on an avenue. The brazen hits got Little Pee Wee noticed by police. I think those, those three homicides were indications of, of a certain level of immaturity. There were people who could have done a much better job of maintaining the business of avenues without attracting that, that level of attention. Authorities began building a painstaking case against Richie by gathering evidence from some unlikely sources. Snitches. Things are going smooth until the government steps in and people start wearing wires. Times are changing. The Avenues are one of LA's most notoriously violent gangs. Their alliance with the Mexican Mafia brought them to prominence under Alex Pee Wee Aguirre's leadership. His life sentence led to turmoil after he named his 14-year-old brother, Richie, his successor. The younger Aguirre had immediately orchestrated the murders of three well-known Avenue associates. I think the power m might have gone to his head. He was doing things that were impulsive, probably not very smart in the overall business sense. Prosecutors were determined to take down the avenues. By 2005, they had built a case against Richie. He was sentenced to life for his involvement in the three murders. The avenues rolled on. February 21st, 2008, 11.30 a.m. 36-year-old Cypress Park gangster 
Marco Salas was walking with his two-year-old granddaughter when shots rang out. The avenues, they, they did a drive-by on him, they shot him, killed him. Fortunately, they missed the little, the little girl. Within minutes, police caught up with the gunman near Drew Street. Two avenues exited the car and opened fire on the officers with an AK-47 and a handgun. After an intense firefight, one of the gang members lay dead, the other severely wounded. It was the final straw for federal investigators who had been working closely with local police for months. The city, in conjunction with the LAPD, finally made the decision to clean out Drew Street. In June, more than 500 law enforcement agents descended on the avenues in the largest gang takedown in recent memory. They arrested 46 people, 28 of whom had been named in a federal RICO indictment against the gang. The massive raid has sent the secretive avenues into hiding, but their lucrative drug operation seems to be unaffected. Every time somebody gets locked up, 10 more step up to the plate. The thing is that there's kids in elementary school waiting to, uh, to join the avenues. They haven't slowed down, in my opinion. The Avenues is an inheritance passed down from generation to generation with honor. The Avenues especially is a generational gang. We see grandfathers, you know, fathers and sons uh, who have been members of that street gang. And that's what perpetuates it. It's gonna continue to go as long as that's accepted behavior in that community. A lot of these kids in Avenues and in other gangs are like cult members. That's, that's their entire world, that's all they know, and every other possibility of an alternative lifestyle is blocked. Some have decided to get out while they can. JR had a son and began to question his loyalty to the gang after 20 years of banging for the avenues. Hold it up. I was tired of the lifestyle. I don't want to put my family through it no more. There's no way you could raise a kid decent. Eventually you go to jail, or eventually you expose your kid to that lifestyle. And it's a no-brainer for me, you know? JR left the gang, but it wasn't with the Avenue's blessing. He now has a price on his head for turning his back. Big adjustments a lot of change, you know. 20 years of living like that, you always gotta worry about your enemy coming. Sleepy's wake up call was a friend's life sentence to prison. He told me, Are you gonna make the same mistake I made? I go, What is that? And he goes, I never got to see my daughter grow up. I went to the joint, I missed all her childhood. So I said, uh, I gotta change. Sleepy left the avenues against the gang's wishes. He's now a marked man. My wife asked me, why do I always look around? I think that's instinct, because it's always gonna be a part of me. Always. That's what's kept me alive. In LA, the avenues all run one way, and few get out alive. A lot of guys didn't make it out. I consider myself lucky surviving these streets. And if you see somebody that's trying to get you involved, run. Don't stop. Because you know what? That lifestyle is going to be nothing but misery. Misery. <laughs>